I want to speak today about this topic, which has to do with, sorry, I'm just uh, adjusting my screen. Yeah, intersective sets. So an intersective set is a set S of natural numbers, which has the following property. So if you take any set A with positive upper density, and I'll explain what that means in just a second, uh, the difference set of A, so the set of all things that are the difference of two elements of A, has some intersection with S. So there are two distinct elements that differ by an element of S. So positive upper density means that for arbitrarily large initial segments of the integers, one up to n, the proportion of elements in that segment that are in A um, is greater than or equal to some delta. So equivalently, the limbs up of the number of elements in A up to n divided by n is positive. So I just want to make a, a sort of slightly historical remark about this. This notion of an intersective set sort of motivated from um, dynamical systems, really, or from a, a Godic theory. It turns out to be equivalent to being what's called a set of recurrence in that context. So if you take a measure preserving system, so that's a, a set X um, with a measure on it and a measure preserving self map T. Um, and if you take a set A of positive measure in X, then there's some um, n in your set s your set of recurrence for which basically the set a comes back to itself uh, under this map t um, in in time m so the, the measure of t to the minus n a intersect a is positive um, that's something that can be proved via what's called the Furstenberg correspondence principle which is the essentially the technique that Furstenberg invented to prove Semiradi's theorem using a Godic theory, but I'm not going to discuss that further here. So I'm going to talk about intersective sets. They're the same thing as sets of recurrence, um, but I'm not going to talk about sets of recurrence anymore. Okay, so which kind of sets are intersective? Well, there was a conjecture of Lazar-Lovas in the 70s, which is was that the set of squares are intersective. And that was proven in the late 70s by Furstenberg using methods of ergodic theory, in particular that correspondence principle that I just mentioned. And also independently by Sharkozy using on the face of it very different ideas related to the hardy littlewood circle method. So let me just remind you what this means that the squares are intersective. It means if you take a set A of natural numbers of positive density, positive upper density, there'll be some two of them that differ by a square a non-zero square. Now, Erdős asked around the same time a related question, which is, are the shifted primes p minus 1, as p ranges over primes, intersective? Uh, the primes themselves are not intersective. For example, you could take the set of multiples of 4, which certainly has positive upper density, but no two elements of that set will differ by a prime for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, he also asked about the sh prime shifted the other way, p plus 1, p at prime. And that was resolved by Sharkozy as well, again in the late 70s, and using somewhat similar techniques to the way that he dealt with the Lovas conjecture. So again, using methods related to the, the circle method of Hardy and Littlewood. There have been various generalizations of this. For example, the set of squares can be replaced by the set of values of any integer polynomial. Uh, provided that it takes the value zero somewhere. Now, I'm going to be more interested, well, I am interested, in quantitative aspects of this problem. So, to get quantitative, let's denote by delta sub squares of n the density of the largest subset of the first n integers, which does not have two elements differing by a square. And similarly, Let's denote by delta sub primes of n, the density of the largest subset of 1 up to n, which doesn't have two elements differing by a shifted prime, p minus 1. Now, the fact that I stated on the last slide, the conjecture of Lovas, proven by Furstenberg and by Sharkozy, is, so the fact that the squares are intersective, is equivalent to delta sub squares of n tending to 0, if you unpack 
the definitions and the limb sup in the, in the definition of upper density. And the shifted primes being intersective um, is equivalent to delta sub primes of n tending to zero. But you can ask the question of how quickly do those quantities tend to zero? And in large part, that's actually an unsolved question. So Furstenberg's work, which uses ergodic theory, doesn't give you any quantitative information. In fact, it, it uses the axiom of choice at some point. Sharkozy's work does give quantitative bounds, but they're relatively weak. So for example, delta sub squares of n is at most essentially log n to the minus one third. So this means if you take a subset of one up to n of size about n over log n to the one third, there'll be two elements in there that differ by a square. And for the shifted primes, it was even worse with Sharkozy's techniques. Uh, this delta sub primes of n is less than basically one over a log log term squared. So it tends to zero, but only just. Now, what's the state of the art on these? So Sharkozy's bound for squares has been improved. So Sharkozy got log n to the minus a third. That was improved to log n to a function um, to the power of minus a function tending to infinity by Pintz, Steger, and Semeredi. Their paper gave a function that really only just tended to infinity, a quadruple log. But more recently, Bloom and Maynard uh, showed an improvement of that. So that that function omega of n can be basically just a triple log. And that's the best bound currently known for that problem. But in the other direction, it's conjectured that in fact, there's a power saving. So this is a, what could be true is sort of remarkably stronger than what's actually known. It's conjectured that if you take a subset of one up to n of size n to the one minus c, for c an appropriately small positive constant, then there should be two elements in there differing by a square. Um, in the other direction, an example of Ruja shows that you can't hope to get c to be too large. So he gives an example of a set of size about n to the three quarters uh, with no square difference. Now, what about the shifted primes? So Sharkozy's band there was even weaker, and that was improved by Lucier, and then by Ruja and Sanders, and then most recently by Zoe Wang, who was a, a DPhil student here at Oxford. And she obtained the bound written there. So delta sub primes of n, so the density of the largest subset of one up to n with no two elements differing by p minus one is bounded above by basically e to the minus log n to the one third. Okay. So all of the works that I've just mentioned uh, use, yeah, all of the works I've just mentioned use some variant of what's called the density increment method. And that method has its origins in the work of Klaus Roth from the 50s on three-term arithmetic progressions, so on Semeredi's theorem for progressions of length three. So let me just very, very briefly sketch how that works, just in, a, in an overview without any details. So what you do is you suppose you have a subset of one up to n, with some density alpha, and it doesn't contain two elements a and a prime differing by a shifted prime p minus one. Then you use some Fourier analysis, aka the circle method, um, somewhat complicated. And using that, you locate a subprogression p, which has, which is fairly big, so its common difference is quite small. So its common difference is at most alpha to the minus c for some constant c, and its length is at least alpha to the constant times n, on which the density of a is a bit bigger. So it's no longer alpha, it's now a small, a, a multiple a little bit bigger than one of alpha. And then you iterate that argument, you keep increasing the density, and after a certain number of iterations, about log one over alpha, uh, the density will get all the way up to one, and it can't pass one, otherwise you'd have a contradiction. Now, that's a, an oversimplification in many, many ways, so I haven't said anything about what using Fourier analysis means. But also, when you pass to a subprogression, um, you no longer have the shifted primes, but you have the shifted primes restricted to that subprogression, and you're going to need to understand something about how those behave. And understanding how the primes behave on progressions is a very, very famous classical problem. It has to do with 
zeros of Dirichlet alpha functions. And even if you allowed yourself to assume the GRH, um, you're not likely to be able to understand what happens um, when the common difference goes much beyond the square root of n. So that's a sort of hard barrier to that method. And if you work out what this gives, this limits, even if you use the generalized Riemann hypothesis, this limits the density increment argument to proving something like that the uh, delta subprimes of n, the biggest density of a subset of 1 up to n, with no two elements differing by a shifted prime, is something like e to the minus root log n. So a bit better than Zoe Wang's bound of e to the minus log n to the 1 third, but actually not all that much. So the main thing I want to talk about today is a result I proved last year, which gives a substantially stronger bound for this delta subprimes of n, so a power saving. Another way of saying this is that there exists a constant c bigger than zero, such that if I take n to the 1 minus c elements up to n, some two of them will differ by a shifted prime. And if you allow yourself to assume GRH, uh, you can actually take that constant c to be somewhat reasonable, about 1 12th, anything less than 1 12th. So let me make a couple of remarks about that theorem. Well, first of all, what should probably be true? It should probably really be true that um, this delta subprimes of n behaves almost like n to the minus 1. So in other words, as soon as you take a subset of 1 up to n, even of size n to the 0 0.01, which is tiny, there probably should be two elements in there that differ by p minus 1. But that does seem to be just a completely hopeless problem. Now, the most naive sort of random heuristics might suggest that even a set of size something like log n squared uh, should contain two elements that differ by a shifted prime. But Ruger actually constructed a much bigger set of size almost a power of n, but not quite, so e to the log n over log log n, with no difference of the form p minus 1. Now, another remark is suppose you have proven the theorem that I stated here, or you want to prove the theorem I stated here. Well, just by considering a particular set A, so the set of all A less than n, which are divisible by some number Q, uh, well, you can convince yourself that the fact that that set A contains two elements differing by a prime minus one implies that there is a prime congruent to one mod Q and of size at most Q to the one over this exponent C. Now that's basically Linux theorem. So the theorem that I stated at the top implies Linux theorem um, that the least prime in a progression one mod Q is at most Q to some um, fixed power L. So those are some remarks about the theorem. Um, and so you definitely can't hope to get the value of little c being better than 1 over L, where L is the best known constant in Linux theorem. And you probably shouldn't even hope to get anywhere near that either, because this theorem is a, is a more general thing than Linux theorem. Uh, but just parenthetically, the best values for that Linux constant L that are currently known are a little bit bigger than 5 due to Xyloris building on some celebrated work of Heath Brown, and even on GRH, um, only two, two plus a bit. OK, so what are you going to have to do to prove that main theorem? Well, from the discussion so far, first of all, you'd have to do something other than the density increment argument, because as I sketched that density increment argument that has been used in all of the previous works, even on GRH, won't get you such a power saving. And you're probably going to need, because you've got to prove Linux theorem along the way, you either have to use Linux as a black box, or you have to use somewhere the things that are used in proving Linux theorem, which are basically a lot of classical analytic number theory um, about zero density estimates, so how many zeros of L functions there are near um, off the half line near the one line, and something called exceptional zero repulsion, which basically says that if there's a zero very, very close to one, it sort of repels all the other potential zeros a little bit away from it. So you kind of know that you're going to have to do these two things to prove the main theorem. Um, 
Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be, I'm going to assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And that easily implies Linux theorem. So all of the zero density estimates and exceptional zeros and so on basically become trivial if you assume GRH. And so I'm, for the most part, going to ignore that second point. Uh, but I, can't, I still can't ignore the first point, even if I am um, assuming GRH. OK, so what is the plan if we're not going to use a density increment strategy? Well, what I do is to prove that actually the shifted primes have a stronger property than being intersective, which is called the van der Korpert property. And rather than stating that in the abstract, um, let me tell you the theorem that I shall prove. So assume GRH, then there's a function psi from the integers to R, which has the following properties. So first of all, it's supported on the set of shifted primes less than n. So it's only non-zero on that set. Secondly, it's Fourier transform, its exponential sum, or, or rather the real part of its exponential sum, is almost non-negative everywhere. Um, so it's lower bounded by essentially minus n to the 11 over 12. But if you think about it, the sort of, if psi is a function that has sort of average value one, then that exponential sum could be as small as minus n, uh, which is a lot smaller than what I've written there. So this is sort of saying that the exponential sum is, is close to being positive everywhere. Um, and then I'm going to, this is just a normalization condition, and I'll be a bit vague about what that tilde means, but yeah, I'm going to assume that this psi does in fact have average value one. So there is a function supported on the shifted primes, which has almost positive Fourier transform, and that's what's called the van der Korpert property. So it's not too hard to show that if you have a function psi like this, that it implies a good bound for the Sharkozy type theorem for the intersectivity property. In other words, that this implies the main theorem that I stated on the previous slide. So I won't actually prove that in this talk, but I do want to show you a model statement of the same type, um, which gives the, the rough idea. And then I just before going on to that, let me remark that the, this van der Korpert property about having a function supported on your set with a in essentially a positive Fourier transform, it implies being intersective, but it's actually strictly stronger because Bourgain constructed an example of a set that um, is intersective, but which doesn't have this van der Korpert property. So we're getting something here by aiming for a strictly stronger result. Okay, so now let me, um, first of all, let me just check the time one moment. Okay, time seems to be going fine. Yeah, so I want to give you a kind of model version of the implication that having positive Fourier transform implies being intersective. And I'm not going to talk about this setting exactly, but I'm going to talk about something else. And I'm going to show you an argument due to Lovas, um, which proves the following theorem. So suppose that Q is a product of distinct primes that are all one mod four. And then I'm going to be interested in essentially the Sharkozy problem for squares mod Q. So suppose that A contained in Z mod QZ doesn't have two elements A and A prime differing by a square mod Q. Then the conclusion is, that the size of A is at most square root Q. So this is a very good bound, but it's for a, it's for a sort of a weaker problem because being a square mod Q is somehow a lot easier than being a square. I mean, you can of course see that most clearly when Q is a prime, half the residues mod Q then are, are squares. Um, so it's much easier to be a square mod Q than it is to be a genuine square. But nonetheless, this is a really interesting theorem. And that's a theorem which I think is due to Lovas, and it uses something uh, called Lovas's theta function, although I'm not going to phrase it that way. Okay, so let me, let me sort of go through the argument a little bit. So first of all, let's consider a fixed prime that's one mod four. And we define the following function mod p. So the function is, is one at zero mod p, and then at the squares mod p, other than zero, 
it takes the value two over one plus root p. So that's a function supported on the squares mod p, and it's one at zero and this two over one plus root p at, at the squares other than zero. Now you can compute the discrete Fourier transform of this function. Um, so what I've written on the left here is basically the, the discrete Fourier transform of the non-zero squares. So here, e of t means e to the two pi i t as usual. And this is basically just a Gauss sum evaluation. And what you can compute is that the value of this is what's written here. So half times Legendre r over p, square root p, minus one. And what you can observe about that is that it's real, first of all. And this is basically because the squares are symmetric. If x is a square, then minus x is a square, because p is one mod four. Um, so it's real. And the smallest it can be is, is minus a half one plus root p. And therefore, the discrete Fourier transform of, of f, which is defined like that, is a real and non-negative function. So we've constructed a function here that's supported on the squares mod p, and its discrete Fourier transform is real and non-negative. So this is kind of like a nice discrete analog of that van der Korpert property that I mentioned before, albeit for a different problem. So for the problem of, of squares mod q rather than anything to do with shifted prime. Um, and then we can also note this normalization property. So the Fourier transform at zero is one over square root p. Okay. So that was for just for one prime p that's one mod four. And now if I consider a q that's a product of primes that are one mod four, well, I can take a product of f's like the ones that I just constructed. And with a little bit of work with the Chinese remainder theorem, what you obtain is a function on z mod qz, which has the following properties. So it's supported on the squares mod q. It's one at zero. Uh, it's discrete Fourier transform at zero is one over root q, and it's discrete Fourier transform everywhere is real and non-negative. So that's a function that's just an explicit construction um, of the, a product of the functions that I showed you on the previous slide. So how do we use a function like that to get an upper bound on the size of a set A for which A minus A contains no squares mod q? So suppose I have such a set A. So I suppose I've got a set A in the residues mod Q, such that the only square in A minus A is zero. Well, then I can write down the following. So the expression on the left here, this um, circle here means um, the, it's basically the convolution of A with, with the, the characteristic function of minus A. Uh, but yeah, this, this 1a circle 1a of x is basically the number of ways of writing x as a difference of two elements of a um, times f of x. Now, f of x is supported on the squares. And so the only place at which these two functions are non-zero at the same time is x equals zero. Uh, so that explains this equality here. And then by the normalizations on the previous slide, well, that's a over q. So as I said, this f circle g is a slightly, um, it's, it's like convolution, but with a, one of the functions has been reflected. Okay, so we have that equation. Now, this expression here, you can take the Fourier transform of that and use the Blanchard identity. So the Fourier transform of this, it's an inner product, basically, of a convolution and an f. So it's the same as the inner product of the Fourier transforms. The Fourier transform of this convolution is the square of the Fourier transform of A. And so the left-hand side, once you've worked out the normalizations, the left-hand side is this expression here. But everything here is non-negative. So of course, the absolute value of the Fourier transform of A is non-negative, of course. But I constructed that weight function F to also be real and non-negative. So I can just throw away all of the terms except the R equals zero term. And then again, if I work through the normalizations, what I get is this expression here, of a squared over q to the 3 halves. And that's it. So if you compare those two um, expressions, so the first one's an equality and the second's an inequality, you get that the size of a is at most square root q. So as I say, I believe that argument is due to Lazar Lovas. He originally formulated it in the context of um, 
what's called the Lovis theta function. But you can decode it into essentially just a, a, a fairly elementary discrete Fourier transform argument. Now, as I said, this is a model question that's quite different to what I've been talking about in the main talk. But nonetheless, I do want to make a couple of remarks just about that. So the first remark is that actually no bound like that is known, at least in certain cases where all of the primes pi are three mod four. So I really use the fact that the, the primes, when p is a prime that's one mod four, the squares mod p are invariant under x goes to minus x. And therefore, the Fourier transform of them is automatically real. But of course, when p is three mod four, that's not the case. And things get a lot more difficult. And as far as I'm aware, no bound of the type, the size of a is less than q to the one minus a constant is known, even for this mod q problem. Uh, so that's a pretty serious obstruction to proving power type savings for uh, Sharkozy's problem for squares. Basically, you can't even do it mod q, at least if you choose um, q to be a, some products of primes that are three mod four. And then another remark, uh, the general scheme of argument, this sort of Fourier transform positivity is actually remarkably similar to the cohen elky scheme um, for getting bounds for sphere packings and, and to various other things. So it's quite a common um, mode of argument in retrospect. Okay, so now let me go back to the main thing that I was talking about, which is the shifted primes. And so let me state again this van der Korpert property for shifted primes. So I'm going to assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis so that all Dirichlet L functions have all their zeros, all their non-trivial zeros on the half line. Uh, then I claim that there is a function, a weight function psi with the following properties. So it's supported on the shifted primes less than N. It's got almost non-negative real part of its Fourier transform. And it's normalized to have average value roughly one. Uh, maybe I should say to avoid confusion, this psi will depend on n. So there's not one function psi that works for every n. So that's the van der Korpert property. As I remarked, that implies that um, a good bound for the Sharkozy property for shifted primes for the sets of intersectivity property. And I just sketched a model argument for how that sort of implication goes. So how are we going to construct this psi? Well, I'll build up to that in various failed attempts. Is there a question? No, OK. Um, right, so what's, what, what's the most naive thing you could try and do to construct such a function? Well, you could just take the function that's one on the shifted primes and zero everywhere else. But if you have any experience at all in analytic number theory, you're tempted to not do exactly that, but rather to take the von Mongol function, so to weight the primes with a logarithmic term so that their average value is one. So that would be the, a, a sort of naive first attempt. Why don't we just take basically the characteristic function of the shifted primes? So does that work? Um, well, it, uh, it does satisfy the first property, obviously. Um, actually, you might object it doesn't quite satisfy the first property because the von Mongolt function is also supported on prime powers, not just primes, but let me ignore that. Uh, it has the correct normalization. So the third property, that's the prime number theorem, but it does not satisfy the second property. Um, and in fact, it seems the best way to try and obtain the second property is to, is to first of all ensure at least that the Fourier transform uh, is already almost real rather than try and get a real Fourier part, um, a positive real part. And that's definitely not the case for this, uh, for Mongol weight. So for example, if I take the Fourier transform of that just at one third, uh, it will already be an imaginary number. So n over two times one plus D of, of two thirds. Okay. So what about a second attempt? Now this looks a bit strange at first sight. This has been, so psi two of n, I basically take lambda the von Mongot function of n plus one times lambda of n minus one. 
So it's basically kind of um, a characteristic function of numbers for which both n plus one and n minus one are primes. So you do, bear with me for a moment, you do expect this to have a real Fourier transform, uh, at least at rational numbers, and that's because it's symmetric modulo p. So for instance, modulo five, we would expect um, that function to be supported uh, on the values zero, two, and three modulo five roughly equally. And so its Fourier transform should be something like this expression here. So the sum of these frequencies, um, zero, two, and three, which is a real number um, because the set of frequencies, two, three, and zero is invariant under x goes to minus x. So there's something where you at least, at least at rationals, uh, you expect it to have a real Fourier transform, but it does have some problems. So first of all, there's no reason to expect this to be real and positive. And in fact, in this example mod five, if I take r equals three here, it won't be positive, even though it's real. And then the, the problem that's sort of staring us in the face is that we don't have any hope whatsoever of saying anything rigorously about this Psi 2, because even basically even the fact that this is non-zero is the twin prime conjecture. Certainly the fact that this, um, this has more than finitely many numbers in it support is the twin prime conjecture. So it's an interesting thought experiment, um, but definitely seems a bit hopeless. Nonetheless, I'm going to carry on with that thought experiment and try and address the positivity property. So the function I just defined, lambda n plus one times lambda n minus one, if I assume standard kind of Hardy-Littlewood conjectures on twin primes, we do expect it to have a real Fourier transform, but not necessarily a positive one. But to make something that ought to have positive Fourier transform as well, we're going to put in a further weight, which is highly concentrated near zero modulo p, which has the effect of, of making the Fourier transform modulo p uh, tend to be positive. So let's write down the following. Psi sub three of n is what we had before. Lambda of n plus one, lambda of n minus one, where lambda is from Mongol, times basically the square of a divisor function. Um, so the number of divisors of n normalized by its average value one over log n. Okay, so the divisor function tends to have extra weight modulo p um, at zero. And the reason for that is roughly the following. So the average of this function is one, normalized divisor function. But the average of this divisor function over integers divisible by p is roughly two, um, essentially because, because you're divisible by p, that gives you um, an extra you, you've got all of the divisors of n over p, um, as well as the, the divisors of um, co-prime to p. So you get twice as many divisors as a typical integer. So this divisor function, you expect it to have some extra weight uh, at zero mod p. And if you square it, you get a, a weight around four over p at zero mod p. And that is just enough, at least conjecturally, uh, to make the Fourier transform of this psi three, um, both real and positive, um, at least at rationals. Okay, so now we have a function that's supported on the shifted primes. And if we assume all sorts of high powered hardy littlewood um, correlation conjectures, we can convince ourselves that we expect it to have real and basically positive Fourier transform. Well, at, at, at rationals with small denominator. Okay, so that would be our third attempt. But unfortunately, it doesn't, we don't expect it to have positive Fourier transform near zero. And that's basically because near zero, we expect its Fourier transform to behave just like the, the Fourier transform of the unweighted integers, really. Um, and that's a Dirichlet kernel, which is something like sort of sine n theta over sine theta which is not positive everywhere. Now, there's a standard technique in harmonic analysis to get around that, which is to introduce 
what's called a Feye kernel instead of the Dirichlet kernel. So instead of just considering the cutoff, a sharp cutoff to one up to n, you instead introduce a tent function. So this function psi four is, is what I had before, but times a, a sort of tent function, this, um, this one minus n over absolute value of little n over big N, uh, positive part, which is basically what is what's called the Feyer kernel. So that is a function with positive Fourier transform. Okay, so I think that this function psi four probably ought to have basically real and positive Fourier transform um, everywhere. So it should be satisfy this van der Korpert property that I stated before. However, there remains this issue that we have absolutely no hope whatsoever of proving anything about this psi four, because even to show that it's non-zero infinitely often is the twin prime conjecture. And I haven't made things better by introducing these, these ar this arithmetic weight to all squared of n or this fair kernel weight. So I've still got that very fundamental issue um, that I can't say anything about this without proving the twin prime conjecture. So um, regardless of what I sort of might believe on heuristic grounds, proving anything about this is impossible. Yeah. OK, so what are we going to do about that? So there's the, that's our fourth attempt at constructing a function psi with the van der Korpert property. So here's the sort of another key idea is to replace some of those terms by what are called Fourier truncated proxies for these functions. So this is an idea that originates in, in Civ theory. So take, for example, the von Mongolt of n minus one, the characteristic function of the primes plus one. Let's replace it by something that's basically a kind of a characteristic function of almost primes, uh, but sort of on, has nice properties on the Fourier side. So here is an example of a Fourier truncated proxy for the von Mongolt function. And this is something that I learned from work of Heath Brown. So this function lambda q, so it's the sum over little q less than big Q, Mobius of q over phi of q, um, times basically a Ramanujan sum. So the Fourier, the discrete Fourier transform of the residues co-prime to q. So this is a function that's been cooked up to have two properties. First of all, it's been deliberately cooked up so that its behavior, its Fourier behavior at rationals mimics that of the von Mongol function. But it's entirely supported on rational frequencies with fairly small denominator. So this is what I'd call a Fourier truncated proxy for the von Mongol function. And as I say, it's been curated especially to mimic the behavior of von Mongol on progressions to small moduli or equivalently um, tested against rational frequencies with small denominator. And there are corresponding Fourier truncated proxies for the divisor function as well that you can introduce. So because those functions are going to be more tractable when you try and multiply them by this term, so von Mongol to n plus one, let's just replace these two terms here by their Fourier truncated proxies. So as I said, to give an example of how these are easier to work with, if I don't want to prove the twin prime conjecture, but I'm happy to replace one of the instances of the von Mongol function with its Fourier truncated proxy, um, then at least assuming GRH, I can hope to get an asymptotic for this sort of an expression with moderately large values of Q. So even up to Q being about n to the one half. That doesn't prove twin primes because this lambda Q is not supported on um, shifted primes anymore. Uh, but that's, to, that, that, that's not important for, for what we're doing. Okay, so here is a, a fifth attempt at defining a function that's going to work for us. So we take all of the features that I'd introduced so far from Mongol to n plus one, but now I'm going to replace the from Mongol to n minus one and the divisor function by Fourier truncated proxies for them. And then I'm going to keep the Feyer kernel in there. So that does turn out to work. Um, 
So to actually show that this is something whose Fourier transform is basically real and positive, you need quite a lot of machinery. You need the, the hardy little word circle method, um, and then also some bespoke estimates relating to basically correlations of these truncated uh, Fourier truncated functions, which I hadn't seen anywhere else in the literature. So that turns out to work, all of this assuming GRH. And that completes my discussion of the main theorem assuming uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis. So just to conclude, I want to say a few words about what happens if you don't assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So this makes matters very significantly more complicated. And the paper, so I, the only paper I've made public is the, the one that doesn't assume GRH. I have a manuscript that does it with GRH and that's 33 pages long, but without GRH, you need a, it needs 104 pages. So why is it so much more complicated? Well, basically without GRH, this Heath-Brown approximant, the lambda sub Q, cannot be shown to approximate the von Mongolt function nearly so well. So basically there might be zeros of zeta or of other Dirichlet-Alf functions that are sort of skewing the behavior of the von Mongolt function um, and that lambda cubed can't see any of those. So what one needs to do is to introduce a more complicated approximate that basically sees all of those zeros. So here's roughly what it looks like. We call it lambda sharp of n. So it's the approximate I had before, lambda q of n, but with a correction term um, corresponding to a sum over all of the zeros, not just of zeta, but of L functions of small conductor. <coughs> so it's a sum over all of those zeros. I'll say exactly what zeros in a moment. N to the row minus one um, times a term F here, which I won't uh, describe explicitly. So rho ranges over non-trivial zeros of all directly L functions of conductor up to a small power of N and which have real part greater than or equal to 0 0.99. Now on GRH, there are no such zeros, so this degenerates back to lambda Q. But of course, unconditionally, we cannot show that there are no such zeros. All we can do is get a bound on how many there are. So as I say, unconditionally, you do have these zero density estimates, which basically tell you that there aren't too many of these zeros rho, and they get even less frequent as the real part of rho tends to one. So actually that sum, rho over zeros is actually is convergent, which is nice. So it converges nicely. So that is um, a kind of corrected, truncated approximate to the von Mongolt function, which also sees potential zeros of Dirichlet-L functions and hence sees more of the potential irregularities of the, of the primes. So as I said, the, I'm not going to describe what those F terms are, they're not hugely complicated, but I'm just going to omit uh, a discussion of them. Okay, so you can show that that lambda sharp is very close to lambda in Fourier space, which is uh, a suggestion that it's going to be a helpful thing. So let's go back to trying to construct this weight function psi on the shifted primes. And what I've written here, so now not assuming GRH, it's the same as what I had on GRH, except I've replaced Heath Brown's lambda Q function by this new approximate that also sees some of the zeros. So that turns out not quite to work, and you've got to include a couple of extra terms. So first of all, what I call a damping term, uh, and that is needed to deal with the contributions from those correction terms that I introduced. <coughs> so that's a, a very complicated thing. The construction of that is iterative, and as I say, pretty complicated. It involves summing various things over zeros. Um, now, there could be a Siegel zero, so that's a really bad zero of a Dirichlet-L function, uh, very, very close to one. And if there is such a thing, we basically mod out by, by just right at the start, restricting to the progression um, zero mod Q1, where Q1 is the modulus of such a single zero. 
it also turns out, and this um, this is really annoying, this Fayer kernel also isn't quite right. And the reason is that you need to control not just the exponential sum of that, but the exponential sum of that twisted by these n to the row minus one terms. And those, it's quite possible for some of those to be large when the actual, the exponential sum of the Fay kernel itself is not so large, uh, which is a real issue. Uh, but after some messing about, I came up with a pretty elaborate construction where you replace the Fay kernel with a much more singular kernel based on this function x to the minus one half e to the minus x. And essentially some stationary phase type estimates with the gamma function allow you to show that you do have the relevant control there. So as I said, this, um, this results in the length of the paper expanding by a factor of three to include all of these extra complexities that you need if there might be um, non-trivial zeros of the um, of, of zeta and L functions. Okay, so that concludes um, everything that I wanted to say. So thank you for listening.